Well, I just got back from the Philippines just a week ago. I don't live there anymore. I lived there about half my life. But, you know, there was a day many years ago when when we were we were pastoring in Saskatchewan, Edie and I. My wife's name is Edie. I'll show you a picture tomorrow. And my, my last daughter. And uh, so we were pastoring a church. It was going very well. We just built a new building. Everything was just so good. And I came home one day from the office. I said to Dee, you know what? The time has come. We've got to go to the Philippines now. She said, I agree. So we gave it up. Gave away everything we had. Sold what we could. The rest we gave away and we went. We stayed there over 30 years. And, uh, and then there came a day when the Lord said, it's time to leave. So we turned the church over and all the ministries and the works and we left. You see, it doesn't matter where you are as long as that's where God wants you to be. Amen. And it doesn't matter whether it's going well or going bad. The worst time in the world to quit is when it's going bad. That's just quitting. But when it's going good and you leave, there's got to be something behind that because nobody wants to leave when it's going good. But the Lord made it clear to us that that we uh, and I still go back. Uh, I, I try. I, I told him I'm only coming two times a year, so I can't come any more than that. I, I just hate to travel, and uh, I have flown across the Pacific over 250 times, and I just don't want to do that trip anymore if I have to anymore. So, um, but God is, uh, so I'm working with uh, many churches in Canada and other countries. I was just in Dubai in April, and I'll go back there in, in uh, December, and uh, some other places that we go regularly. And uh, a lot of, uh, uh, most of the churches that I work with are um, Filipino, Indian, or African, or something like that. Uh, you know, you do that for 30 years, you get more comfortable there, you know? <laughs> So uh, we did an air tree, and uh, how many of you saw when Sister Susan, Pastor Susan, had us on the Zoom, or any of you on the Zoom? Did you see it? Yeah. One, two, three, three. Yeah. And we did some Zoom training for a while. Yeah. I think uh, uh, a few months, maybe. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Was that 2020 or 2021? Yes. Don't be nice. 2021. 2021. Last year. Last year. Yes. Yeah. No, oh, that's two years ago. This is 2023. <laughs> and uh, we had a good time together. Uh, that was uh, really a lot of fun. And uh, so, uh, then this is my first opportunity to meet you and to meet Pastor Rafael and Lani in, in person, living color, you know. And uh, so good to meet them. And I drove up today on a motorcycle, and, uh, and uh, I enjoyed that. So I'm still young. I'm only 72. I've never had a motorcycle. I'm still strong. Amen. And, uh, still travel. And uh, the only thing is that I get tired earlier than I used to. I used to never get tired. Now I now I get tired and I can fall asleep while I'm sleeping. I mean speaking, right? <laughs> so it's something like that. So um, uh, that's just a little bit of our life in, in the Philippines. And uh, God has been good. We thank the Lord. Yeah. The, uh, the work in the Philippines are almost all of the pastors in that church today, the main church. Um, almost all of them were saved in that church. We led them to Jesus. They went through the Bible school. They got filled with the Holy Spirit. They were water baptized. They found their wife or husband, got married there. They got trained for the ministry. They continued. So most of the workers and leaders of that local church, we led them to Jesus. And then I challenged them, because they're not young anymore. Now they're 38, 40, 42. Uh, that's not old yet, but they're not young, you know. And I said to them, now look, I said, I took you when you were young. I led you to Jesus, and I disciple you. That means that I have made sure the church will live one more generation. Mm -hmm. So I said,
said, now who are you going to get and train so the church will live another generation? If we don't win, reach, and train the young, our church has no future. Amen. You see, every one of us is going to get old. You may not be 72 yet, but you know what? You will be. Should you live, if God gives you grace, you'll get there. So who's going to follow when our time is done? So now they've got a whole bunch of young pastors in training in their 20s and getting ready for the next generation. And that is our primary responsibility. The primary responsibility is not to take care of each other but to reach the generations below, to reach the generations below. If we don't save our kids, we've lost everything. And you know, lots of times kids grow up and they're no longer with us, they don't serve the Lord, they do this. Listen, it, 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 it must become a passion for the church that we've got to raise up young people in the leadership of the church so that we have a future. Can I have an amen? amen. <laughs> so we've worked on that. And uh, I'm thankful that uh, on our, our, our very first anniversary, um, we, uh, we rented the ballroom of the Shangri-La Hotel, our first anniversary, many years ago. And uh, 2,000 people came on the first anniversary. 56 people were saved. That's the only number that was important. The 2,000 doesn't matter. The 56 does. That's what really matters. And the number one task of the church is the evangelization of the world. The number one task of the Christian is the evangelization of the world. The number one task is not to worship, not to have a church. Not, that's not the greatest importance. The greatest importance God put this church here to reach the community, to reach your neighbors, your life for the glory of God. Amen. If we do not win the lost, what is our purpose for being here? Amen. Jesus didn't save us so that we would become spiritually fat. He saved us that we'd be a light and a witness and we'd be salt in the world that we live in. Can I have an amen? amen. And I always tell people wherever I go, God has called you to reach your neighbors. People that live around you. How many of your neighbors do you know their names? How many of your neighbors do you know their kids? How many of your neighbors do you actually know what's going on in their life? So wherever, see I practice this stuff, wherever I've lived, I've got to win my neighbors. If I can't win my neighbors, what witness do I have? The people that live next to me, if they don't know I'm a Christian, who does? Amen. Amen. So we moved into Airdrie. Um, it's a little city, 80,000 people. And uh, we were able to get a house, an old house, 40 years old. First thing we do is start meeting the neighbors. Got to meet the neighbors. Got to make friends of the neighbors. And uh, so I meet the neighbors and um, meet this one, meet that one. They know we're Christians. Then we have block parties. We send out invitations, handwritten to everybody down the street. Come to our house, come sit in the front yard, bring your own lawn chair. We'll provide the hot dogs. Come and let's have some. And people come. And they come and we sit and we provide a place and we talk and we get to know people so we can meet the neighbors and some they evangelize them for Jesus. And they find out we're Christians. So the lady that lives next door to me, the, the man that lives there, his daughter committed suicide. So who did they call first? Us. To come over there and help them. And the man across the road dies. And someone is over there. And so we become involved in the community. And the neighbors come to our house. Why? Because we're Christians. Not because we're pastors. Being a pastor is leading a flock. Being a Christian is reaching your world. Amen. That's what it's all about. And uh, I really challenge the people of God wherever I go that if we don't evangelize our neighbors 
In other words, the place you're living today, God put you there. And if you're not evangelizing your neighbors, whose responsibility is that? They're your neighbors. Uh, one of my members one time came to me and said, Pastor, uh, my labor, the neighbor that lives next to me is very, very sick. Will you come and pray for him? I said, absolutely not. It's your neighbor. You go and pray for him. Yeah. Don't ask me to pray for your neighbor. It's your neighbor. So you go and pray for your neighbor. <laughs> yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor. <laughs> we only, you know, sometimes we say, well, we've got to have a pastor to pray. Who said that? Where did you find that? Where's that in the book here? It says, where, where do we have to come? Where do we, why do we, where does this come from? It comes from the old Catholic days when the priest has to do it. <laughs> but hey, that's not Bible. We are all ministers of the new covenant, meaning Jesus is in us. The power is in us. The life is in us. It's in you to make a difference in your work. It's in you. Hallelujah. It's in you. Yeah. So as Christians, we try and reach our neighbors. We try and witness where we can because we want people to come to Jesus. Amen? Yeah. And we pray for our neighbors when we sit at our table in our dining room, the three of us, and we pray for all of the neighbors by name because we know their names. And we pray for them. How can you pray for people whose name you do not know? It's not good enough to say, oh, Jesus, save my neighbors. Come on now. It's not good enough. I, I need to get to know these neighbors so I can actually pray for my neighbors to come to Christ. You understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to be a little bit personal. I'm a little bit confrontational. I hope you don't get upset about that. But, 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 you, but, you, but you see... You have to love me anywhere. You can't go to heaven. So you just have to listen to me. See, that's the thing. It works kind of like that. So I, 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 I really challenge your heart. My burden is to help God grow his churches. That's what I do everywhere. God wants every local church to grow. Do you know what grow means? It doesn't mean adding people. It means bringing people to Jesus. Doesn't matter how many people, now listen to me carefully, doesn't matter how many people immigrate to Canada and come to this church, that's not church growth. We're just transferring the church from one place to another. But church growth means we're expanding the kingdom. There's lots of people around us that don't know Jesus. That's what our mandate is. Our mandate is to evangelize the world. Amen. 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 Now, I'll just talk to you a bit about prayer. I, I, you didn't tell me how long. Now, I can go short, maybe just 120 minutes. <laughs> no limit, Pastor. No, no, no. no, no. I, won't, stand up an hour. I won't do that to you. I want you to have, are you going to have some prayer yet, right? So I don't want to take all of the time. Uh, I don't want to take all of the time. But I do want to share it. Let me ask you a question. Uh, so why do you pray? Why do you pray? Which one you request to that? Because you have a request. Yeah. Why do you pray? Huh? To have communion. To have communion? To connect to Jesus. Connect to Jesus? To be in his presence. Yeah, to be in his presence. Why do you pray? Yes, well, we have something to we, we have something we need, right? Yes. Sometimes, yeah, yeah. Why else would we pray? Because we thought to pray. Because we what? We are thought. We are. We thought to, to pray. Yeah, yeah. Anybody else? Why would you pray? Because we have God. We have what? We have God. Yes, that's true. We have God. Amen. Amen. Now, Jesus assumed that we all pray. See, in Matthew chapter 6, the whole chapter deals about the three disciplines, or not the whole chapter, the first whole section deals with the three disciplines of a Christian. Number one was giving to the poor and doing it right. 
Number two was fasting and doing it right. And number three was praying and doing it right. So Jesus used the expression, he said, when you give to the needy, this is chapter six, verse two verses, you should do it very carefully, confidentially, so that nobody would know that you're doing it, and no one would tell you what a good job you've done, but your Father in heaven would see you, and he'd bless you for giving to the needy. Second, he said, when you fast, of course, all believers fast. Yes. Now, fasting means I don't eat any food. <laughs> so many times when I have talked a little about fasting, our dear members would say, Don't you get sick if you don't eat? If you don't get food, you won't get sick. No, the trouble is you eat too much. That's why you're sick all the time. Anyway, uh, all right. Fasting was understood to be a fundamental discipline of every Christ follower. So that's why Jesus taught. He didn't say, listen, if you ever think about fasting, you should do it like this. No, he said, when you fast, meaning it's understood that you will fast and there's a right way to do it. So, Several years ago, we began a process that we would, like we have certain values in the church. We have a statement. We value worship. We value Bible preaching. We value prayer and fasting. We value, you know, we have a list of values, things that are important to us. So every year we would review them. And I would ask the question, one time we said, we believe in fasting and prayer. So then I asked, the, I asked the staff the question, I said, well, how often do we fast and pray? And, well, then somebody said, we always fast in January for several days. So I said, we do something once a year, and we think that it's something we value. Hey, if you only do it once a year, it's not important to you. It's like someone says, we value going to church, and I go every Christmas and Easter. No, we don't have to go to church. So I've, I've taught something for many years. The only things you believe are what you practice. What you do not practice, you do not believe. So I said to them, you know, we've got to change our value statement and say, we don't believe in fasting or we as staff and church are going to have to begin to fast and pray together regularly to show that it's important to us as a people of God. So then we went from doing it in January to doing it four times a year for three days. And I would make all of our staff work all day and fast for three days with no food. I'd say, listen, you got to set an example. You know what? Nobody died. <laughs> now the reason I say that is because, particularly for our Filipino brothers and sisters, food is the number one value. You know, I mean, what else? How do you spell fellowship in Filipino? F O O D. Yes. <laughs> Too much of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's where this came from. You see. Anyway, all right. <laughs> So we began to teach the church that if you really want God to work in your life and answer prayer, you will fast. In fact, you have never become desperate for anything if you've never fasted. If you cannot deny your appetite, then your appetite controls your life. Amen. So if you... If you cannot bring discipline into your personal life, the thing you cannot discipline is the thing that rules your life. And you know, for many of us, it is food. It is food. First thing we think about in the morning, the last thing we think about when we go to bed. I need a snack. I need a bed. I need a bed. What 
three days, four days. Anyway, you understand how that goes. So he began to teach the people, if you want to know God, you will need to introduce fasting into your life. I practice it regularly every years. And I say it with no break. I, I've written about it in some of my, if you if you get my Facebook post, I have a number of times written about fasting and made videos about it. And uh, I have done it for many, many years, for three days, seven days, 10 days, five days, whatever the Lord leads me to do. And I, do, I don't eat any food. I just drink water, sometimes a little black tea for the taste, and that's it. And you know what? I, I always, always, I always hear from God during those times. I always have God really speak into my life. Because what I'm telling the Lord, God, you are more important to me than anything in this world, including my supper. Now, when you give to the poor, you do it like this, Jesus said. You don't let your left hand, your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Meaning, you do it quietly, you do it sincerely, and God honors you. When you fast, he said, you don't do it like hypocrites. They go around and they, they don't comb their hair. They look, someone says, oh, he's fasting. Look, no, no. You anoint your head with oil. You make yourself look good. And so that nobody knows that what I'm doing is I'm seeking God with fasting. And then the third thing Jesus said, when you pray, don't pray to be heard on earth. Pray to be heard in heaven. In other words, it doesn't matter how good you sound when you pray. If your heart is toward God, God hears the prayer. And you can pray a very eloquent prayer, and if that prayer is not really from your heart to God, God doesn't hear it anyway. But you can say, you know, the shortest prayer that actually works at times is, Help! God, help! You know, sometimes that really works. <laughs> Why? It's really from the heart, you know. <laughs> Lord, there's a lion on the road. Help! You know? Okay. My wife's mother, she's Filipino son, she's gone to heaven. She was only five feet tall. She was maybe 40 kilos, 45, very small little lady. And she was walking, walking out. She was living in Manitoba or the, on a farm. And she went out, she had to walk across the field. And as she's going across the field, you know, Total. The bull starts coming to water. These things go, you know, the thing's 2,000 pounds, eh? And so there's grandma, she's only this tall. And she, the bull gets right close, she turns around, in Jesus' name, stop! And the bull stopped. She said, thank you. And she went on and left. <laughs> that prayer works too, you know. <laughs> Just remember that next time there's a bull chasing you. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. So when you pray, you pray in secret so your Father will reward you. Now that in heaven, that does not mean that you don't pray in prayer meeting. It just means the motive is when you pray, you want God to hear you. Now, I am uh, James chapter 5 is one of the most encouraging verses on prayer that I'd like to refer to. And it's chapter 5 of James, and, and verse number 16, it says, Confess your sins one to another, pray one for another that you may be healed. It's perfectly acceptable to pray one for another that we may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. A righteous man. It really is, or I think at the NIV it says the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Powerful and effective. Then he goes on, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Another translation says Elijah was a man 
just like us. Think about that. Elijah, just like us. Yeah, you can look at the person beside you and say, just like you. Just like Elijah. Elijah was a man just like us. It's one of the most encouraging verses in the Bible. Sometimes we, we, we look at the per people in the Bible and we think, well, oh, they're all the spiritual giants, look what they did. But all of them had faults and failures. I mean, there's, there's, there's only about just a very small handful of people in whom there was no fault recorded in the Bible. They're all. Now, even great Abraham, the father of faith, lied several times about his wife because he was afraid. Yeah, 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 yeah. He told, he told the king, that's my sister, because he thought, you know, she's beautiful. They'd probably kill me and keep her. <laughs> He's the great man of faith, yeah. How would you like that for a husband? Oh, no, you're not my wife, you're my sister. Go over here. <laughs> okay, no problem. But Elijah was an ordinary man just like us. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> That's really something. He just prayed and said, Lord, stop the rain, the rain, Lord. And then... He prayed again that it would rain. Oh, it did not rain for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. He just prayed. He just prayed. Now, I'm not suggesting that when you pray, you can just pray any foolishness and, and that, that God will do it. But there's a purpose. And, and I, I want to encourage you that when you pray out of your relationship with God and you pray with faith. See, Elijah expected that when he prayed there'd be no rain, that it would not rain. He expected something to happen. Um, I've had a bit of a habit over the years. If I have a, a prayer line and people come for faith or for prayer, and I will ask them, I'll say, well, what do you expect God to do today? Does that mean it's time to quit? No. <laughs> what do you expect God to do today? What do you want God to do for you? Well, you know, I, I, well, you know, I like the baby Lord, but I mean, I mean, I mean, goodness. Well, after about 30 seconds, I realized they want me to pray, but they don't expect anything to happen. So I wonder, why should I pray? Why should I waste my time if there's no faith that God can answer a prayer? Amen. Amen. You understand what I mean? It's, sometimes we say, well, people, when you pray, well, when someone says, would you pray for me? I always say, exactly what should I pray for? We get the idea sometimes that we just should pray. Well, uh, uh, you know, somebody did say we, we, you know, prayer is part of our relationship with God. Yes, we talk to God. God talks to us. But when it comes to seeking God, asking God for something, what exactly do we want prayer for? You know? Um, <laughs> I've had a little policy when people have money problems. Somebody says, pray for my money. I said, all right, are you a tither? Do you give 10% of your income to God? And they said, well, no, then I can't pray for you. So if you're not willing to commit your income to God, I can't, I can't waste my time praying because you, you don't believe in honoring God. So how can God honor you by giving you money? Amen. Amen. Ooh. You say, oh, Pastor, you're nasty. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's what happens when you get old. You just get nasty. You know? so, so I would say to somebody, well, listen, so you're not a tither. Would you make a commitment to God to tithe today? And if you will make that commitment and do that, then I will pray for your financial needs. Otherwise, you get this fixed with God first before you start asking God to fix your money. That's what I mean. So, um, many times by aligning ourselves with what's right, God blesses us. Amen. And I just want to 
pause there for a moment. Do you know that tithing is an act of faith that declares God takes care of me. Amen. That's why I'm tithing. Amen. Amen. So why would you ask God to help you financially if you're unwilling to tithe? Mm -hmm. Because you're saying, I don't trust God. But God, give me, give me, give me, give me. God, give me some more money. You'll never have money. Oh, God, give me some more money. You know, maybe before we even start that prayer, we should say, Lord, uh, help me not to spend so much money. <laughs> Two girls come to me for prayer one Sunday. Pastor, will you pray for me? We're burning in that I said, what's the problem? He said, well, we started a little business and both of us have charged up our credit cards to the very maximum limit and, and we need God to pay, out, pay off this debt. And I said, well, did you ask God before you put that debt on your credit card? <laughs> and he said, well, no, we were going to do it. I said, no, why should God pay off your bad debts? Come on, guys. We treat God like he's stupid. This holy, mighty God that created the world, we make a problem and say, God, when you fix it, why should God fix it? Now, I believe when there's true humility and we take responsibility for our problems, that God is so merciful, more merciful than any human you will ever meet. But he requires an honest and contrite heart. So the girls stand there and they say, well, I laughed at this. So you want God to pay off your credit card because you started the business and you went broke. And that's now God's responsibility to fix. So I said, here's what I would pray. That God will give you wisdom, number one, to manage your finances better. Number two, that God will show you a way to pay off your debt. God is not responsible to pay your debts. You pay them, you pay them. And if you didn't ask God before you borrowed or took or bought, then why are you asking him now? Like in other words, oh God, oh God. We cry out to God, usually because we've done something dumb. Now, of course, sometimes we're really sick and it's not our fault. Eh? And sometimes we're sick because it is our fault. And when I overwork and I'm not feeling well, I don't ask God to heal me. I say, God, will you forgive me for not taking care of my body? Amen. Some people live on sugar and get sick, and then they say, Jesus, heal me. And Jesus says, put the sugar. Forget it. Let's leave that alone. <laughs> That's getting pretty personal, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So Elijah was a man just like us. And he prayed. And God heard him. God does hear people. God does answer. God does Amen. answer. What I'm trying to teach today, we need to be responsible men and women of faith. And the bottom line of our praying is not us. We are not the center of prayer. God is the center of prayer. It's not all about you and it's not all about your troubles. If God never answers another prayer for you, will you love him and serve him and honor him anyway? That's the real question. Now, just a couple of things that I want to say and then I'm going to quit. In Luke chapter 11, when Jesus spoke uh, of the Lord's prayer, and we, we you know, uh, the, the Lord's Prayer is, it, we can pray, our fathers are in heaven, and we can pray, that's fine, that's fine. But it really wasn't designed to be a prayer, it was designed to be a model for how we pray, okay? And it starts with our Father, of course, and, and, and it starts with worship, there's an honoring of God, that would be your name, oops, sorry. And then the next two parts, are what's most important in this prayer. It says your kingdom come. On the very top of your prayer list 
is that God's kingdom would come, that people would be saved, that church would be expanded. That's the top of the prayer list. Not God, any honor box. In other words, God's agenda is the most important part of our prayers. God, and if you're in a difficult situation, God, what do you want to do here? What, what will honor you in my life? What will bring about your purpose in this situation? So God's kingdom. Secondly, your will be done. God's will. Now, this teaches me something, and I don't want to wreck your theology. Not everything happening in this world is God's will. If it was, he would not say, pray that God's will will be done. And what I have to do, you know, I, I, I have as many troubles as any other human being. So we have a trouble, and we say, God, what's your will in this situation? What do you want to happen? We go to God saying, God, this is what I want you to do. And some, some of us are so immature that when God does it, we say, God, it doesn't matter. Or we say, God, what did I do that you allowed this to happen? Well, I don't know, but God didn't allow it to happen. It, it, life happens. Trouble comes. Job said, Man's days are few and full of trouble. Being a human is a troublesome experience. And I am a blessed believer. I am blessed every day of my life, but I still get flat tires in the car, and I still have an accident, and I still have this problem, and that problem, and I'm still getting older and have aches and pains, and I'm a blessed person every day of my life, but the blessing doesn't prevent life from happening. Amen. So you get mad at somebody, and there's repercussions. They don't want to talk to you. Now whose fault is that? That's yours. So you got to start with repentance and saying, God, i got to make this right. Sometimes we got trouble with people, and God isn't going to do anything until you make some things right with them. So somebody said to me on my just a couple of weeks ago I'm in the Philippines and I'm having we're having some Japanese food there sitting here. Somebody said, Pastor, I got a problem with somebody. Do you think you could help me with it? I said, No. I said, I'll tell you what, you know what the Bible says? If you've got a problem with somebody, go and talk to them directly. And they said, Yeah, but you know. I know this person on this. Now, but you know, we, we Filipinos don't like confrontation. Well, maybe Filipinos better become Christians and understand that it's part of Christian faith to be honest with others about problems. The highest culture in the world is the kingdom of God. Man. Not our ethnicity, not our country, not our origin. Because we are all made one in Christ to submit to the one culture of heaven. Amen. So I said, well, why don't you, um, why don't you go talk to them about it? And I said, then the Bible says, if they won't listen, then you get a witness and go, that's what Jesus taught in Matthew 16. Then you take a witness and two of you go talk and try and get this thing worked out. And then I said, if it doesn't work yet, then it says, tell it to the church. In other words, get the leadership involved. Don't run to the pastor first. You go and talk to the person you've got a problem with or that's offended you or that you know you offended or that you lost your temper with or that you were unkind about. <laughs> and I don't think for a moment that everybody's always good, you know. I think there's plenty of tempers in the church. I have met them many places. <laughs> but I have a bad habit when people lose their temper, I burst out laughing. Anyway, all right. <laughs> so we pray for God's will to be done. Before you say, God, I want this, I need this, you say, God, what is your will? What do you want to have? That's what's important. And we like to skip over that and go to the others, Lord, give us our daily bread. Lord, I'm praying for 
what I need today. And it's perfectly legitimate to pray for your needs. But what's most important is God's kingdom and God's will. You're number three. Okay? And you will make less mistakes in life if you begin to put the kingdom and the will of God first. You'll begin to look for God's will. And that will save you so much trouble. I mean, when it came time for us to uh, leave the Philippines, I didn't leave ministry there. I'm still very involved. My last trip, I commissioned some more pastors, and I did this, and I did that, and I do all that. And I just love it, and I love the people. I like everything about the Philippines, the food. In fact, I can even handle the traffic. I mean, it's okay. It's like, it's like, I'm okay with all of that. <laughs> but there came a time when the Lord said, I have a different will for you right now. Most important thing in your life, folks, is that you do the will of God with your life. I don't care what you want to do. You're a child of God. And God has a right to your life. And what does He want you to do with your life? God's will. God's will. God's will. Now, one last scripture and I'll quit. Pastor, I'm sorry. You made a mistake of giving me the microphone. The priest must have and, and it's really hard to shut me down. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm trying to quit. I'm trying. <laughs> but Hebrews 11, 6 says... Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is, which we do believe he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's why we pray. That's why I keep praying for people every day. And I don't stop. George Mueller, the great man of faith, he fed orphans in Britain. He's German. And uh, one, one time a man said to him, uh, George, would you pray for my son? He's backslidden. And George said yes. George Mueller prayed for that young man. He wasn't young anymore for 40 years, every single day. And someone said to him, well, don't you think it's about time to give up? No, he said, God. Always answers prayer. I will pray for that man all the days of my life, and if nothing else, he'll get saved after I'm gone. But God will answer. Amen. Now, if you don't have that kind of determination, you're going to give up many times long before an answer comes. So I have prayer lists. We pray for the same things at our table every, every night, my wife and daughter. We pray for the same needs. Until they're answered. We actually write them down, the prayer request, the date we started, and the day it was answered. Because we like to keep record to encourage ourselves that God answers a lot of prayers. Amen. And we get stuck sometimes because there's two or three on there that we're praying and just praying and nothing's happening. But we forget there's probably a hundred other ones where God is working and working and working and working. So we pray. Men should always pray and not give up. Not give up. And I, I want to encourage you to be men and women who pray about the kingdom and God's will. God has a purpose for this local church. Uh, God has this church in Stony Plain for a reason. You're here. In fact, God brought you to this church for a reason. Amen. And have you found what that is? Have you have you begun to be what God has called you to be at this place? There are no people that God brings to, to us, that, that are directed to us, that don't have a purpose. You're not here to attend church. You're here to be a part of the life of the church. The life of the church. We don't need a whole bunch of people attending church. We need a whole bunch of people working in the church and in the kingdom. Amen. You know, God never called you to warm a plastic chair. Amen. He calls you to be a mover and a shaker Amen. and a builder. Amen. God 
is a builder. Are you a builder? Yes, amen. amen. Okay. So, Heavenly Father, we just pray that you give us real courage today to be uh, faithful in prayer, in that we will not be discouraged when things don't move quickly. Lord, some of our prayers require great amounts of intercession. Other other of our prayers are answered quickly, but sometimes, Lord, there is a persistence needed, and I pray that you would cause us to be a people of great persistence for your glory. And Lord, may your kingdom come in power to stony plain. May, may your will be done. May your will be done in this church, in the life of every one of its members and attenders. And may every worker understand that God has a higher purpose and calling for them. And may that will be accomplished. May the kingdom be expanded. Oh, Lord, may your kingdom rule over us as we work for you in Jesus' name. It's very broad, spiritual time, but so much, so much learning. Amen? Amen. So much learning. We have some Rima and revelation from God. I don't know what's your Rima church, but really expectation is very, very important. And we have just two prayer items tonight. And before we utter that prayer, is develop that expectation. Yes. Amen. Develop the expectation. Yes. Amen. And every prayer that we have, we must expect something happen. Yes. And Lord, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you so much for bringing us the mighty man of God, Pastor Dennis, in this place. Lord God, it's not an accident. Lord, I believe this is your divine appointment, Lord God, to release your pressure life Lord, to the leaders, to the workers of this church. Lord God, with so much expectation, we believe, Lord, something will happen tomorrow during our divine worship service, Lord God. Everything there right now, Lord God, there will be a victorious Sunday worship tomorrow, Lord God. And Lord, we hope and pray, we expect something to happen tomorrow, Lord God, and our lives, all the attendees, Lord God, all the people that will hear your words tomorrow, Lord God, they will not be the same again, Lord God, and they will be changed, Lord God, they will become that agent of evangelization of this community. Lord God, thank you so much for reminding us of our identity, that we are saved for a purpose. Lord God, thank you so much for reminding us once again for that purpose to bring lost soul to you, God. Lord, God, thank you so much, God. Instill in our hearts, in our minds, that purpose. We are saved to serve. We are saved to be an agent of evangelization, of our family, of our neighbor, of our friends, of our co-workers, of this community of Stony Green, Spruce Grove, and all neighboring places. Lord God, thank you so much. God, please sustain that eagerness in us, Lord God. No tribulation, no trouble, no hardships will hinder us to go and preach your gospel, your good news. Lord God, thank you so much for reminding, for giving us that reminder to each and every one of us that we have the higher calling. And Lord God, we hope and pray, Lord God, that we can be endured up to the end. And Lord, as we wait for your second coming, we can walk worthy in our calling. Yes, Lord. Thank you so much, God. And one thing, one prayer item, Lord God, that make your 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 children hunger and thirst to know you more. And that will seek you more, Lord God, because we believe that we're going to seek you first in your kingdom. All these things shall be happen to us, Lord God. Lord God, with so much expectation, with so much belief, with so much faith, 
We believe, Lord God, that this plane, the same plane, Church of Yes, Lord, Global Ministry, will be an agent of change, an agent of evangelization, that through this church, to the members of this church, Lord God, many will be saved. Thank you so much, God. And that we can be expanded, Lord God. Our, our border will be expanded, Lord God. We're gonna, not only in the story plane, but we're going to expand our territory in the area of Spruce Grove, in the area of Parkland County. Lord God, thank you so much. Thank you so much, God. You're so great, great God. And Lord, we'll pray that we're going to also practice fasting in our lives right? that, that appetite will, will not manage us will not govern our lives Lord God Lord God, thank you so much God that we are crucified already it is not I who longer lives in us but Christ lives in us Lord, thank you so much because the Holy Spirit that who is in us is greater than who is in the world. Thank you so much, God. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the life of Sardens. Thank you so much for this life, God. And I know that it leaves more anointing, Lord, more rima tomorrow's for tomorrow's service. And we expect, Lord, that we are open for that revelation. Lord, we offer you back all the glory, all the honor, all the thanksgiving. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we also pray for our food. This is mean spell here. Bless us food, Lord, that we give nourishment and crystal body as we have fellowship tonight. Lord God, be in the midst of us. Holy Spirit, thank you for already moving in our lives. Thank you for tonight, God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.